tonight's theme is recognizing the conditioned mind. This is adapted from chapter three, from the heart of who we are, realizing freedom together. It begins with a quote from Wei Wu Wei. Why are you unhappy? Because 99% of everything you think and everything you do is for yourself, and there isn't one. Way, way. I was assigned to clean the outhouses. Eight of them spread throughout the property, a bucket of cleaning supplies in one hand, a bucket of lime in the other. I headed off, albeit grumbling. I headed off. I was a monk. So whether I wanted a particular task or not was irrelevant, deeply irrelevant. One of the gifts of being a monk is that whatever your task seemed to be wasn't what your task actually was. Yes, there was an expectation that the outhouses would be cleaned by the end of the work period. However, there was a much greater expectation that you would be paying close attention to your experience as you went about your task, no matter what your task was. There was an understanding that you would be practicing directing your attention to the present moment noticing it when it wandered off and specifically where it went, then consciously returning your attention to now. I remember where I was on the cedar chip path, outhouse number one to my right, outhouse number two to my left, when I got it that the tape loop playing in my mind was just that, a tape loop. This dates me, doesn't it? If you weren't alive in an era when music was recorded on cassette tapes, then hang with me here. What's great about the analogy of a tape loop, what's most significant, is that the same songs repeat over and over and over. They'll play, they'll play until you turn the machine off, the batteries run down, or the tape breaks. On this blistering summer outhouse cleaning day, the voice of the conditioned mind was clear. And friends, I mentioned uh, how I define the conditioned mind in the meditation, but because I know when these get posted, they're separated, I want to just name for someone who didn't see them hear the meditation, um, that I refer to the conditioned mind, or I, I, I use that term to refer to the mind that has been shaped by society, culture, um, the mind that has been habituated to uh, perceive reality in a specific way. The teens at peace and schools sometimes uh, used to talk to me about how the conditioned mind is also the mind of limitation. If only it weren't so hot. So now I'm back in the story, friends. On this blistering, blistering summer outhouse cleaning day, the voice of the conditioned mind was clear. If only it weren't so hot. If only I'd been given an indoor assignment today. If only it were Sunday, Sunday afternoons, which we called holy leisure, were the only unscheduled times at the monastery. And a flash of insight, I got it, that if only, quote unquote, was a scam. I got it that if only implies that the external content of my life was responsible for my internal state of being. I recall putting the buckets down, hands on hips, pausing. For the first time, I recognized a pattern with the voice that had previously been in the background of my experience, like the background music in the shopping center that you don't notice until you do. I had recognized my internal dialogue before, the chatter that prior to awareness practice, I had assumed was simply, quote unquote, me. However, I hadn't caught on to the pattern of the chatter. It's as though I had noticed the songs that were playing, but though they felt familiar, I hadn't noticed that they were on repeat over and over and over. As the test of reality, one reason I value experience over theory is because experience cannot be argued with. It's not debatable. No one will ever be able to convince me that any internal conversation that begins with, if only, will lead anywhere promising ever. If you haven't already, test it out for yourself. B. 
be open, curious, find out. To be clear, there's value in an insight that comes in the form of a creative solution to a problem. That's not the if only thought that I'm referring to, however. I'm referring to the voice of the conditioned mind that's constantly asserting that you should be different, that life should be different, that if X, Y, or Z would change, then you'd be happy. If you're hearing this, it's likely that you recognize this storyline as a trap. This storyline belongs to the conditioned mind. When we first introduced the notion of the conditioned mind in our mindful studies class, we asked the teens to describe what they think that term might mean. And as I mentioned a minute ago, they quickly come up with this definition about limitation, the mind of limitation, the mind that's been shaped and influenced by parents, school, society, and culture. The mind that's been habituated to think in a particular way, as I mentioned. It's, it's the mind friend that's friends that believes this is how I'm supposed to be. This is how life is supposed to be. And it's the mind that regrets the past and worries about the future. One thing I like to ask the teens through Peace in Schools is if they've ever rescued a dog or cat or horse. And teens often will relate to the way in which it's very common for rescue animals to be more fearful. This, of course, is because sometimes they've been conditioned to be that way based on previous experiences. They're just trying to survive, right? It's the same for us. The conditioned mind isn't bad or wrong. It's just often how we're trying to survive. Under the masks we put on, there's often a deep desire to belong. And, and one way we could talk about our conditioning is that it's how we've learned to try to achieve belonging. So while the conditioned mind isn't bad or wrong, it can be limiting. It assumes, for example, that we don't inherently belong. That's why we also talk about it as the mind of limitation. So when this animal is um, in a new and safe home, it's interesting to me that it still might not be able to fully relax and enjoy the experience because of its conditioning. It's limited by the imprint of its past experiences. And over time and with practice, this can change. When we identify with the conditioned mind, we believe what this mind of limitation asserts. We believe that what it's asserting is truth. So if I'm conditioned to believe that the grass is always greener on the other side, and I identify with that if only conditioning, whatever the mind asserts simply feels real and true, especially when I'm in the midst of it. For example, it might seem real and true that things just never work out for me. We are conditioned not to question our conditioning. So friends, just for the fun of it, if anything comes up for you, Drop something in the chat about an example of something you can, maybe you're something you've been conditioned not to question, but you can tell it's it's just a habituated belief. Something like, things never work out for me. Just see, I'm curious to see if there are things that you might want to name in this moment. Yeah, perfect. Uh, I'm conditioned to believe death is scary. I'm conditioned to believe I can do it. <laughs> Great. Yes, I. you know, I'm a bit slow on the uptake. Um, I, I never win anything. It's not easy to be happy alone. I'll never be enough. Very common one. I've been conditioned to think my sister is better than me and things will work out for her, but not me. I can't do it. They don't really like me. I have a sensitive constitution. You must earn, succeed, be perfect, don't question. Okay, friends, y'all are y'all are on a roll. <laughs> it's too late to make up for past mistakes. Jovan, Jovian, I hope I'm saying it again. I remember you from last week. So welcome, welcome back. I'm glad you're here. Hope you've been practicing some unconditional love. 
<laughs> and things will be better when. Good. Okay. Yeah. Friends, y'all are, y'all are on a roll. Okay. So consider for a moment how we collectively identify with this quote unquote, if only conditioning. Our capitalist structure is born of and thrives in an if only environment. From a really young age, we're conditioned to believe that if only we had fill in the blank, then we'd be happy. This perfectly sets the stage for us to believe that our sense of well being depends on objects. And by objects, I mean condition standards, such as being my quote, ideal weight and or circumstances in general, how much money I have, if I have the quote, ideal partner, and so on. This way of thinking assumes that our well-being is intimately tied to the content of our lives. Happiness is an outside job. If only I had a new car, I'd be happy. If only I had a new partner, a different job, more money. These objects within consumerism are placed on a pedestal. They become props in the play of our longing. Within consumerism, this if only view keeps us purchasing bound in the role of the consumer. And this conditioned creation of consumerism thrives off our personal and collective perception of lack. It requires it. So in the same way that we've inherited individual con conditioning, I'm conditioned to believe that in order to receive love, it's important to get things right, for example. We also, and you know, follow the schedule, follow Rick's schedule. Got to start right at 645. That's what he said to do. <laughs> Got to get it right, friends. So we also inherit, absorb, adopt collective conditioning. These two are so intimately woven that they cannot with accuracy be called two. The fish does not exist as an alive being outside the water it swims in. If the water's polluted, the fish will be ill. It can be no other way. So friends, I'm going to read just a bit more, and then I'm going to invite you to engage in an exercise with me. You certainly don't have to do it. If you're like, I'm exhausted, I just want to chill, and, you know, I don't want to watch Netflix and chill, but I do want to watch a Dharma talk and chill. That's 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 fine, okay? But for those who are with me and want to participate and follow along, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and get um, some paper and a pen or type on your computer um, with some prompts I'm going to be offering in just a minute. So the limitation of individual conditioning. Consider the various ways you've been conditioned by parents, school, society, community, culture. Consider the set of beliefs and assumptions you refer to in your mind, perhaps in order to touch an experience of wholeness. So I'm going to invite some prompts. And, and as I invite these prompts, I also want to invite you to consider your positionality as you go. So because we are talking about individual and collective conditioning, at least in, in this part of the, the heart of who we are. So my conditioning as someone from the American South, for example, is quite different from the conditioning of someone who's raised in a different cultural context. The great thing about this kind of list making or journaling is that you can write it, if you can write it down, you've got some distance from it. So writing is a great opportunity in my experience to get a belief or an assumption at an arm's length away. If you can write it down, you at least intellectually can recognize that what you're writing down is not you. This step is critical in any form of awareness practice to recognize yourself as the observer of your thoughts and beliefs rather than the thoughts and beliefs themselves. Writing can be freeing for this reason. It can assist in the disidentification process. One way you can access how you've been conditioned is to respond to these prompts I'm going to share with you tonight. And so should you want to take this on with me, be sure not to edit yourself. You may, as you go into breakouts later, you may wish to, to share with others uh, what came up for you, but you're not required to. This can all just be in the privacy of your own heart. Remember, you'll want to 
see this as a way to reveal the conditioning that's often lying quietly in the backdrop of your experience. And as I referenced in last week's time together, what we are unconscious to silently governs us. So this is a practice from, uh, from the book called Fleshing Out Our Conditioning. So we are intentionally pulling what's been in the backdrop of experience to the forefront. We want to see what's been in the shadows. So write without editing and without indulging internal commentary. Here are the prompts to get you started. Okay, I'm just going to pause and check some faces here. Everybody who wants to have a pen and paper ready. Okay, we got some thumbs up. Great. Awesome. So, in order to be loved, I need to. This first thing that comes up, just fill in the blank. In order to be loved, I need to. Remember, no right or wrong here. During times of conflict, I should. During times of conflict, I should. My parents or guardian always taught me that. Again, just going with the first thing that arises, it may seem even silly to you, but you're revealing what's sometimes in the shadows. My parents always taught me that. I deserve. I deserve. I'll be comfortable when I'll be comfortable when I'll be happy when I'll be happy when I know I should avoid I know I should avoid. If only 
What's your if only? Other people would be happy if I Other people would be happy if I It's best not to It's best not to I'm usually afraid of I'm usually afraid of to feel successful I need to. Or someone, when I was doing this with a different group, pointed out how different it was for them if I said, to be successful, I need to. So go with whichever one feels most alive for you. To feel successful, I need to. And then does it change it at all to say, to be successful. I need to. Last two. The thing I should most watch out for is the thing I should most watch out for is And I never seem to be able to last one, friends. I I never seem to be able to obviously you can keep going with this. If you're in a small group, you could even have each person in the group offer a, a different prompt. The point is to begin to get a map of your conditioning. This map, this opportunity to have your conditioning at an arm's length creates a concrete way for you to disidentify from the conditioned mind, to recognize yourself as more than the mind of limitation. You are aware of your conditioning. You are not your conditioning. This identifying from your conditioning is key on a path of liberation. And the most beautiful part, disidentification is a contemplative technology that can be practiced. It's a tool that can be used in moments when you're suffering. As a practice, it becomes more and more refined. Over time, your capacity to catch the subtleties around dis identification increases. So for example, if you're new to practice, you might catch that you're identified with the conditioned mind after you've raked a family member over the coals and really given them a piece of your mind. With practice, you'll catch the identification as it forms rather than in the aftermath. You'll feel your body tighten in a particular way. You'll notice an internal energetic shift. You'll catch a change in the landscape of the mind. You'll notice the quality or tone of your thought shift. And with practice, you'll be able to step off the train of suffering sooner and sooner until eventually you won't be called 
to board. So what did you notice with that exercise about your conditioning? I would love to pause for discussion now. And I do, uh, as you, many of you know, I really love being able to have back and forth. So if someone's willing to raise their hand, we got George here looking out. He's looking out for us, friends. And he can bring you on. And I will trust that George is going to look out for those while I look at some of these uh, chats, chat comments here. Oh, is there a way to get a list of these prompts? Yes, Elizabeth, they're actually in the, the chapter three of the heart of who we are, realizing freedom together. So if you would like to order that book, you can get it from anywhere that you get books. Thank you for asking. Great. Um, oh, tell me your name, iPhone. George, do you see? Do you see that yeah. hand? Great. Um, oh. Me? Yes. Oh, <laughs> Uh, Susan. Hi, Susan. Hi. Uh, the thing that uh, really had me, that took me back was uh, that when uh, you said, I deserve, the first thing that came up was nothing. Uh-huh. So when you said it again, goodness came up, good. And goodness mm. but that was second susan it's really sobering isn't it somewhere in the recesses of your conditioned mind that belief exists and just wave if you're on screen on this at least this first page of people that i'm looking at if you can relate to that like that there's just this part of you you can see lots of lots of waving there, Susan. There's a part of you that that really believes I, I deserve nothing. Now, yeah. when you, when you inquire more deeply, you my projection would be got in touch with another part of you that has a different experience. But really important to see because, as you heard me say, um, I'm not sure if you were here last week, but one of the teaching points of last week was what we are unconscious to silently governs us. So these. These little pieces of conditioning in the shadows can be what we're acting out of if we're not paying attention. So I'm very glad you saw that. Uh, can I ask a question about that? Sure. Um, I know the nothing is very, very deep. Mm -hmm. Like, in my cells, kind of that, um, you know, and I've done lots of work with lots of teachers, uh, but what wise advice do you have for, because it's, it's not like I wasn't aware of that on some level, Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not like I haven't tried to mm -hmm. address it. I would love to hear what you have to say because it's such a big deal. It's such a big deal. But Susan, what I really appreciate about your inquiry is that it's only a big deal when we're identified with the part of us that believes that as truth. And I actually can tell that the Susan I'm speaking to now is not that part of you. Would you say that's true? That who I'm talking to now is not someone who believes that you deserve nothing? Uh, yes. And it, it, it's the intellectual part of me mm. and the intellectual part of me is not driving the bus. <laughs> it's the nothing that's still driving the bus, it seems like. Yes. So, so what you're describing is what's true for all of us when we get identified. We give the keys to the car to a six-year-old. Now, intellectually, we know we don't want a six-year-old driving. But 
when we're unconscious of these kinds of conditioned habits and patterns, we, we're we handing the keys to a young person that shouldn't be driving. So my encouragement is to find out who that is. Ah, that is, get, lovingly see if she has a name she wants to go by. You're doing this because it's in, what's important is not, I, I'm very supportive in therapy if you wanna go down the road of, uh, parts work and finding out lots of details about her. But what I want to focus on from the perspective of Dharma this evening is what we're looking at here is learning to see who we are. That's a part of you who believes that. But Susan, who are you? That's the thread of inquiry that I invite you to place your hand upon in practice. I get it. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Susan. Thank you very, very much. Um, George, I see Jed's hand, but I don't know if Jed was next. I'll 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 let you Yeah, tell Jed's me. next. Okay, great. Hi, Jed. There we go. Hello. Hi, Jed. Mm -hmm. um so here's here, here's what i learned here I, I i think many of my answers were probably common um you know fear of confrontations uh you know not wanting to rock the boat i'm, I'm sure there's many here that would share those but when it got toward the end there the last two in particular um what surprised me was they were really, my answers um, were geared toward how I feel about and approach my practice yeah. and meditation, which is, which is new for me. I've been practicing maybe five years now, something like that. And so it, it's, it was a little bit like, Hmm, this is interesting that I, that I've, I've built up these, uh, sort of expectations that have become part of the condition of mind uh, while trying to develop a mindfulness. Um, so, you know, for example, um, what should I watch out for? Um, ego taking yes. the... Yes. The yes, Jed, you are in good company. Every spiritual practitioner I've ever met can... can speak to some version of what you're pointing to. Basically in, um, and by the way, I see that Monica, you asked which book in the chat, it's called The Heart of Who We Are, Realizing Freedom Together. So in that book, Jed, in The Heart of Who We Are, I talk about how it's so common that the ego does what it does in relationship to spiritual practice. So I used to, uh, be caught in seeking and resisting in all these objects of the world. Now I have a spiritual practice and the seeking and resisting comes in the form of I'm seeking a really deep meditative experience or I'm resisting a busy mind, right? So we're just, mm. it's, it's, the, it's the same process. It's different content. So that's one of the reasons it can be so helpful to see how your conditioned mind is structured, because you're going to do the very same thing you've done in your life over in the realm of practice. So I've always been a, a striver, just want to, yeah, I made reference to it tonight, you know, get, do things right, do, do, a, do a good job. So you can bet that as a monastic, I tried really hard. I worked really hard. I was very disciplined, right? One of the reasons that I wanted to pair that meditation with tonight's talk about conditioning is it's the releasing of that conditioning that actually let the beauty of what a meditation practice could be shine through for me. So Jed, thank you for sharing. Um, I really uh, appreciate uh, you sharing because I know so many people um, can relate to that. 
And I am going to move on just because I do see we just have 10 minutes left for Q&A. George, are you, um, do you see Farah? Yeah. Great. Hi, Farah. Hello, thank you. Um, I was thinking um, all of this conditioning have uh, made my character and personality so far. And uh, when um, I approach with the awareness, uh, um, I'm thinking uh, how uh, other people, my family, my um, community perceive me is uh, um, through those uh, behavior or character. I if I um, if I uh, want to change all of this, it's kind of scary to be another character. Uh, well, Farah, I'm delighted you're sharing this because what we're speaking about here and what the rest of this chapter goes into is the way in which we're not paying attention to our conditioning so we can adopt new conditioning. We're not saying, oh, actually this conditioning I just caught on to, I see it's very limiting and it's really bad. So I'm gonna just adopt better conditioning. So if I've had conditioning that says, oh, you know, you're a real piece of shit. I don't wanna now adopt conditioning that says, no, you're the hottest thing since sliced bread, right? So, I don't think sliced bread is hot, so that's probably not the best analogy, but you know what I'm you know what I'm pointing to here, right? So we're not just changing the cards on the table. We, to go back to Susan's share, we're exploring what am I, who am I underneath all of the conditioning? What's there that's not shaped by society? beliefs and assumptions that have been adopted, my ancestors, cultural conditioning. What's undisturbed by the conditioned mind? What's untarnished by the conditioned mind? What are you present to, Farah? No, oh, you're muted again. Let me unmute you, Farah, again. Yes, thank you. I, I got the point. Thank Great. you. Great. So. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Do we want to go on to Bruce? Sure, thank you. Yeah, I was able to unmute again. <laughs> Hi, Bruce. I am back. Um, the thing that I, I noticed is the thing I should most watch out for is getting sucked into someone else's version of who I am. Mm. And I I felt that suck a lot <laughs> with a lot of these prompts. <laughs> like saying that I should look at my conditioning because I was drawing blanks on in order to be loved. I mean, that assumes I feel unworthy. Uh, during during times of conflict, I should know what it is I am craving and why. Uh, I deserve not to separate myself out as deserving. I'll be comfortable when I am at peace with what is. I'll be happy when I don't place any emphasis on happiness. I know I should avoid mass media force feeding, especially news and commercials. They are not good for me. Yeah, that kind of stuff. But it's like I, I notice the resistance coming up with the idea that it's conditioning. Yes. Just because something is arising in the conditioned mind doesn't mean that it doesn't have a particular reality or truth to it. I saw in the chat earlier that someone said, well, what if the conditioning is true? So I have been conditioned to stop at stop signs. That's probably something we all could say, it's a good thing we're all conditioned to stop at stop signs. What we're looking at here 
um, Bruce, is how conditioning impacts our direct experience of who we perceive ourselves to be. So some of your responses, Bruce, now you'll have to just try this on and see if this is your experience. But to me, some of your responses sound a little bit like the person who shared who kind of had the spiritual practice conditioning, right? Oh, I'll be happy when I'm not attached to objects that I think are going to make me happy, for example. There's deep truth to that. I, I would say I the, the one addition I would make is that I know that this stuff is taught, uh -huh. but I'm, I'm not referring to any of the teachings. Mm -hmm. I am all of my responses are coming from my personal experience. Yes, and and again, some of them you might say, and that's a a, a true statement. Here's the place to explore. If I got identified with uh, the belief that I'll be happy when I'm not attached to any objects, just as an example, right? You you hear that in these teachings all the time. And I hear that you're, I don't actually remember if that was your exact response to happiness, but I hear that you you are describing your experience. What I'd want to be exploring, if that's what I had written was, is is there a part of me within my own condition system that calls that, names that as truth, okay, that's my experience, and then gets attached to who I need to be in order to be living that all the time. So for example, do I, do I beat myself up if suddenly I'm attached to an object? This might not be your experience at all, Bruce, but I'm just trying to flesh out different ways that you might approach looking at the list and exploring it. Does that resonate? It's okay if it doesn't. You can be honest with me. I'll say no. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. No, no it doesn't. But that's fine. Actually, what I said is I will be happy when I don't place any emphasis on happiness. Okay, great. What happens if all of a sudden you're placing em emphasis on happiness? I wouldn't. I, I actually resist that. Well, well. Uh, happy is such a trigger word for me because what does it mean anyway? So it's easy for me not to emphasize. Okay, well, th this is the encouragement. Explore what part of the conditioned mind experiences resistance because you named resistance in several different ways. That's worth having some inquiry around. What is the resistance? What part of me has resistance? It doesn't mean it's it's not a valid experience. It's just, that would be my my encouragement. I have one more question before we go to Monica, real quick. How did it feel when you felt you had to go into this lecture mode rather than follow your interest in the chat at 6.45? Oh, I actually, I, I delighted in the transition. I really appreciate um, that that uh, this this group has a structure that people rely upon. And I, I, I respect and value that. I I in peace in school it's one of the things I learned early on when working with teens is that there's great people can relax in structure. So when we have the same way the class unfolds each time we gather, there's a tight it can be easeful for the nervous system. So I I, I was totally content to to make a change. Great. Thanks. Yeah, thanks Bruce. Okay. Let's Monica. see. Monica. Hi, thank you for your lecture. It's very interesting. I just have a question, though. I haven't been able to sort of go from the uh, identifying the conditioned mind to the uh, to like the practice. OK, like uh, how to use it so that the practice is not like conditioned is my question. Okay, great. So, so Monica, are you basically saying, okay, now I'm seeing the conditioned mind more clearly, but how do I have a practice that's not so run by the conditioned mind? Right. Beautiful. Through inquiry like that. So first we just see, you've heard many people on the call start to realize, oh, the conditioned mind is grabbed onto practice. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I need to meditate more. 
Well, I will, I won't be enlightened unless I go on more retreats. Okay. So you, you, you start to see, oh, now okay. the conditioned mind is taken over my mm -hmm. spiritual practice. Then once you notice, ah, as I said before, thanks for someone asked what it was and then someone else typed it in. So thank you. What we are unconscious to silently governs us. So if I don't see that my spiritual practice is being run by, I like to call this aspect of the personality, the pseudo Zen master. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Then I that's might just be caught striving in practice because that's what I did before practice. So mm -hmm. step one is to see it and then name it. Mm -hmm. After you can see it and name it, I, I like to use this acronym SNAP. It's like you see it, you name it, then there, you're you're practicing allowing uh -huh, or uh -huh, accepting uh -huh. it. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. the P stands for returning to presence. Oh, interesting. Very interesting. Okay. Returning back to presence. And what we're kind we're coming back not only to the present moment as this little moment in time, we're coming back to presence that encapsulates, that holds all that is. And friends, in terms of me wanting to honor structure, Monica, I just saw that I've run us over by a by a minute, I believe. And so I just really appreciate your your question and a chance to engage. And thank you. Namaste, really. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you so much.